Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have INFPs and ADHD. And so Christian, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Yeah, sure. Um, so I um, was actually just fairly recently diagnosed with ADHD um, about um, two years ago when I started going to therapy and I had suspected that I might have it. Um, in fact, like other people had told, other people who had ADHD had told me that they thought I had it, um, I guess, because they thought, you know, they saw similar symptoms in me as that they as they had. Um, so like, it had been something that I had thought about, but it wasn't until like, I finally started going to therapy that I was like, I really should get this checked out. So, um, so I brought it up in therapy one day, and then my therapist started asking me a lot of questions. And then through just our, like our discussions about um, my personal experience with, with ADHD, um, or like just my, my personal experiences. Um, she, you know, she said, you know, she pretty much diagnosed me with ADHD, but, um, she wanted me to set up an appointment with a psychiatrist, which I did. Um, and so they, they diagnosed me, they prescribed me Adderall and, um, it changed my life. So, I mean, we can, you know, get into the specifics, I'm sure, um, of how it's affected me. But I did want to, um, like, make a disclaimer. Um, so, like, this, you know, having ADHD, um, especially getting diagnosed later in life, um, you know, this is kind of, like, personal to me as it is for everybody who is affected by it. And, um, you know, as I've started going on this journey of, like, understanding it more, I, I've realized that there's a lot, there's still a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and I think that it's really important to, um, that we get the right information out there. Um, I think a lot of people think that ADHD and understandably so, because that's how it's portrayed, um, just on social media and in film and television and just kind of like our common, like folk wisdom about, um, ADHD, that it's, it's about being distracted and it's, it's so much more than just being distracted. And I think sometimes people kind of flippantly use like, oh, I'm so ADHD, you know, when they're a little distracted and it doesn't like personally bother me, but it's just like, it's just, um, it's like that, that just, it's perpetuating like an aspect of ADHD and that's not even like the whole story. So I think then people start, um, maybe they might, you know, just think they have it when they really don't. And that could be not good for them because then like they're, they're trying, they're adjusting behaviors to something that's not, like, they don't even for a mental health disorder, they don't have. So like what ADHD is like my therapist. So I just kind of want to put out there like what ADHD is, but please everyone do your, for everyone who's watching, please do your own research. But just in a nutshell, um, like my, my therapist likes to call ADHD, like a dysregulation disorder. Um, so it's about like just being unable to having difficulty regulating a lot of aspects of your life, like men mentally. So um, poor impulse control, um, um, inability to regulate um, emotions, um, difficulty regulating your attention span. So it is, like I said, part of, it's like, has to do with attention, but it's only part of it. There's so many other kind of like concomitant like behaviors um, that that come with ADHD. So what it is really is just it, it's a uh, it's um it affects the executive functioning of your brain, which is in your frontal cortex, and um, that part of your brain um, helps with systematic and logical thinking, ordering, structuring, um, and um, and also like regulating attention. Um, and then it also like affects the basal ganglia, which is for mood regulation. So, um, and then the other crucial aspect is that like the dopamine receptors um, have problems um, taking in dopamine whenever it's, whenever the, 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 it's released by the brain. So because of that, like that, that affects a whole host of, 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 of behaviors, obviously including attention. So, um, so you have to like get more dopamine in order for you to like feel like doing something. Um, so like where normally, like when you do something and like, let's say you accomplish a task, um, and you get a release of dopamine, 
that for most people like is enough to kind of encourage them to continue doing that task. Um, but with people with ADHD, that is not the case. Um, because like there, there's an issue with like absorbing that dopamine into the receptors. So like you need a, a lot more of it in order to be motivated to do something. So like that plays like into a whole host of stereotypes about people who have ADHD that are, they're lazy. They don't care. Um, they, you know, they, they just kind of sit around and do nothing. Um, but it's really like almost an inability to like will yourself to do something, even though you try really hard. So, um, you know, we can, get into other things later. I don't want to take up the entire time talking, but, um, but, but I just want to put that out there that it's just more than it's so much more than attention. Um, and the other thing too, is that like, um, although I think there is a correlation, you'll probably find a higher amount of, of SPs and NPs with ADHD, but it's by no means exclusive to those types. Any type can have ADHD. Um, from my understanding with mental, uh, health disorders that I've read um, about like people who are knowledgeable about this stuff, um, like Asura Psych, he had a, a YouTube video on this. Like what, what those kinds of disorders do is they like amplify um, or exaggerate certain cognitive functions, um, but it is not like causal, right? So like you being an INFP or an ESFP does not cause you to be, um, or cause you to have ADHD. So any type can have it. So I just want to put that out there and I'm done. <laughs> yeah, so any type can have ADHD. I've met all types that have ADHD. I do find that it's more likely for an MP or an SP to maybe consider maybe having it because one of the symptoms of ADHD is distractibility. And I think a majority of perceivers can relate to that one quality of the distractibility, but mm -hmm. that's not enough to qualify to, to have ADHD. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. So definitely any type can have ADHD. There tends to be a trend with more people who come on my show that are NPs or SPs saying that they do, but it's not yeah. any any yeah. type can have ADHD. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And Leon, would you like to tell us a bit about your journey? That's really hard to follow up. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pass yeah, that. <laughs> Nothing. Oh, just kidding. Uh, so, like my my history. So, um, how has he have affected me before? Was like back in um, high school. Actually, before I went into high school, my pattern was that I would spend five minutes doing this and five minutes doing that and five minutes doing nothing. Like I, I kind of like have a muse to follow. So I think a lot of people who are creative, they have like a muse and the muse takes them into different directions. And then they mm -hmm. have, they might have a certain kind of rhythm. So people uh, live life with different rhythms. So there's that term neurodiversity, everyone's yes. brains are wired different ways. So like, um, um, and I think I was just really fine with the way I was wired. And then in high school, because of the structure and, and the expectations, I felt like I had to put myself away. So I had to put my whole way, just my whole being aside just to do what they want me to do, right? They they, they mm -hmm. make it seem like <laughs> they kind of exaggerated how um, how much high school is going to influence your life. They say like, oh, if you don't get good grades, then, you know, <laughs> it's going to be like <laughs> you're, you're dead or you're like, you, 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 there's It'll no way. You're a loser. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was like, <laughs> I, I was I was really scared. So I was like, wow, I have to really just get this in order. And I remember sitting down and like trying to like fo focus that day doing the stuff they tell you to do in high school. And it was like so hard. And then, and then the thing is, I lost a lot of myself because I haven't recovered all that creativity until mm -hmm. recently. So recently, it's like it's like kind of been a process of rediscovering myself. I had to like kind of um, peel away all the like um, everything that they put upon me, right? In terms of what I, I should be doing. And then now I'm more aligned with myself. I'm like fine. I kind of follow my own muse and. Um, so just to let you know, um, I've done a master's in, uh, I did research in creativity psychology and mm -hmm. I did, a, I wrote a paper on ADHD. So like, and I did interview people like different personality types they have, uh, who, who have ADHD and see how it's expressed in different kinds of ways. Well, it's really fascinating. Uh, what I learned a lot was that my, um, my professor at the time, 
uh, my advisor who I really love, and she's a she's an ENTP. She said that if people are being tested for ADHD, it's oh, good to also test for creativity as well because there's a lot of mm-hmm. corresponding traits. Not necessarily that they necessarily 100% go together, but there's a lot of similarity in, in presentation. And I think it's good to recognize that. And I, I do believe people are wired uh, different ways for different reasons. So that, that's my take. There is a correlation between creativity and ADHD. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I bet that correlation also exists with any and creativity too. Yeah. 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 I mean, like if I, um, if I think of like a lot of the people who are typed as creatives, I, I bet many of them had ADHD, whether, you know, it's like Van Gogh or Shakespeare, you know, some of these people like it just, your brain being wired differently can be a disadvantage, but like, especially in the creativity realm, it could be a real, real advantage in that way because like you're not you know you're just really thinking differently you know um you kind of have to out of necessity because you're wired that way but also like i think it forces you to like figure out ways around you know to navigate a society that is not made for people who are neurodiverse Mm -hmm. absolutely Yeah. yeah like even those who technically don't have ADHD, not diagnosed, but are extremely creative and extremely sort of their brain is always popping out ideas. They, it can probably look as if it's ADHD. And so people may say, oh, they have ADHD when that's not like what you said, it's not exactly what it is. And so right. people who are incredibly creative, who are always generating ideas, it can appear that they might have ADHD, but they don't, they're just creative. So there's like this line, there's like this, this blending of the two where People may assume things, but still, they 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 don't work. They don't work well together. <laughs> like <laughs> creative and having ADHD, but they're both separate technically. <laughs> right, right. It's not a one to one ratio type thing. Yeah. So it's so all like um. Anyway, back at, back in those days when I was doing some of that research, well, uh, I, I looked at some of the papers, and back then they said that well. Creativity does not uh, correspond with ADHD, but those are some of the earlier papers. But actually, when you look at certain subtypes, um, subtypes of creativity, there's a correspondence with ADHD, and a lot of it has to do with like uh, generating ideas. So, mm-hmm. like when it comes to generating ideas, the problem is the execution of it, right? Yeah. So, so people like like especially in Western society, they really emphasize that you've created a product, that you've made something. Um, complete. And so Mm -hmm. a lot of people who are ADHD and they have creative traits, they don't see themselves as creative. They just see themselves as defective, right? So you look at Mm -hmm. like how psychology has defined ADHD. If you look at their manual, it's all traits of deficiency. Mm -hmm. You have all these traits of deficiency. So um, so yes, it's really just uh, difficulty with the the execution kind of part. And then uh, I think when we have that more well, well-rounded view, that actually does increase the possibility of generating ideas. And I think it's healthy for people's like self-concept. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I wonder if extroverted intuition users, like other people might label them as ADHD when they're not, just because yeah. they generate a lot of ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, um, always like, they're always sort of, I guess, in a way distracted because they're always thinking about the next thing that could happen or like the next possibility. And so in a conversation, um, there may be one topic, but NE comes in and sort of brings in another topic that is seemingly unrelated, but makes sense to you. And that can right. definitely look like ADHD because it's like to everyone else, it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <Where's> that? <laughs> and that was literally my whole life as a child. And that's, what, yeah. that's how I became diagnosed. But I have my story. So. Mm-hmm. Yes, we would love to hear it. Okay. Yeah, I'll start. Um, so I was diagnosed when I was nine, um, but I wasn't really professionally diagnosed. Like I, I never got really tested in a way that I knew the severity of it or what I could really do to help me. And so um, I think I was diagnosed because my mom was my teacher, my fourth grade teacher. And I was sitting in class and she saw me staring at the American flag for a really long time. And then when she asked me after class why I was staring at the flag, I said, 
I was looking at the flag because I'm pretty sure it was made in China. And then I thought about all of the people who live in China. And then my mom was like, that's really weird. <laughs> like, of thought. But even before that, um, my teachers would report me like doing random things in class or like for some reason sitting under the table and just completely missing what's going on. Mm. And so my mom was like, oh, this is a little weird. And so I took me to the doctor and basically she just told told him like, oh, she's just distracted. She forgets things. She She's kind of random, mm. essentially. And I was put on medication and really just boom, right there. Nothing else really was done. And so as a kid, I didn't really quite understand. I didn't understand it, really. I didn't understand what it was. I, I just knew I had to take medication every day. And mm. I guess it helped, but I didn't know. And mm. so I think around sixth grade or junior high is when it, I actually really started noticing, like, maybe there is a problem because, you know, I had trouble turning in work and I just had no motivation. And um, honestly, I, I was like, look, this is just how I am. And I hated taking medication every day. Absolutely hated it. But I had to. And I was like, this is, to me, it felt like it wasn't really working. And so throughout mm -hmm. like junior high and high school, I switched medications a lot, a lot, a lot to a frustrating degree. And honestly, it was just, it was a whole entire source of frustration for me. Um, and I think uh, in junior high, all of my friends would notice when I was or wasn't on meds because I, I was taking Adderall at the time, I believe, and I was extremely skinny and stuff because it like suppresses your appetite. Yeah. Really, I think it was just too much of a dose because I would feel like a robot. Like when mm. I was, and my friends would be like, um, are you on your meds today? You're kind of boring. <laughs> like, without, it, without it, I was always very, very spontaneous and more fun. But on it, I, I felt horrible, to be honest. And mm -hmm. I, I think it was the right medication, but I switched a couple times after that, too. Um, but it was extremely, extremely frustrating. And even on medication, I had no motivation to turn in my work or anything. So I think for me, it was a mix of having, first of all, ADHD, and second of all, not a lot of self-discipline. And mm. so I still struggled with the same thing in high school, but as ADHD does, um, I did well in subjects that I really liked and and really yeah. went low in subjects that I didn't care for. I had, I'd never turned in my work sometimes. Um, and it was just not good. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel, I know. Yeah, it was exactly like, same. Like, and I, it's not that I, 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 I went to a, I, I don't want to say prestigious, but like a college prep private school. And so everyone was extremely smart. Everyone was, everyone who turned in their work and was a good student was essentially looked upon as admirable. Mm -hmm. so me being a person who had to go to a different room to take testing or to uh, meet with my teachers, all of them in a room once a year and have them say with my mom, all of them say, hey, you have trouble turning in work. It was basically just like a gang attack on me because mm. it was just so embarrassing. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I hate this ADHD thing. I hate it so much. And I was like, I, I don't like medication. I don't like having this. And it was just, it was very tumultuous for me. And so I think um, by the time I hit college, I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to deal with any of this. And so mm. I stop taking my medication. And I said, I'm going to work on my self-discipline. I'm going to really do well in college. And I did. And so I don't know what it was, but um, I think just really working on my self-discipline was helpful. And mm -hmm. I'm not really trying to trying to say that people who have ADHD just have self-regulation issues. That's not really what I'm saying. But it just, I think it depends on the severity of what you have. And first of all, I don't even know completely if I 100% have it, if, if I can be you know, honest, like, I'm not sure. But as of right now, I, I do identify as having it just because I was diagnosed at a young age. And I'm not sure what the status is right now. And I should probably actually go see, like, get actually tested. Mm. Um, because after doing well in college and, and having these experiences that made me feel like I'm not really sure if this is an issue made me question it, but I don't know, I guess it's up in the air. So that's kind of my experience. And 
as of right now, um, I don't have too many adult responsibilities per se, because I still live with my parents. I, I mean, I'm working, but I live with my parents still, and um, I'm pretty sure it'll rear its ugly head if I do have ADHD once I'm giving given all these responsibilities of an adult. So having to take care of a thousand things at once, bills, taxes, obviously all of that. And so mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know where I stand on it, but I know my personal experiences with struggling with self-discipline and attention issues, if that's it. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting how ADHD can exaggerate parts of type 2. Personality hacker, they have certain questions that they ask to figure out people's types. And one of the questions they use to figure out NE is, do you start more ideas than you finish? Basically, do you have more ideas? Do you start more projects than you end up finishing? And some of it seems kind of like some of the symptoms of ADHD. So being a perceiver can kind of sometimes overlap with traits mm -hmm. of ADHD, but you also need the executive dysfunction to qualify for ADHD too. So you need a certain criteria on top of that. But when I'm, when, when, when I'm thinking about your comment about China, about how you saw a certain object and it reminded you of this new novel thought about something else, that also sounded like extroverted intuition, like that cool. thing. So, so what I'm saying is, <laughs> cause I can see like someone watching this with any and going like, I have ADHD, <laughs> like from hearing that. So, separate. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's very separate. But um, I, I wanted to clarify, I was trying to make like the TI logical distinction because mm. I, I, ADHD is not NE by any means, but I will notice that there are certain overlaps because mm -hmm. when I invite FI users who value it very high up on the show, they'll mention, you know, Joyce, I, I can't finish things that I'm not feeling like. Like, if I don't feel it, I can't finish it. And so mm -hmm. what Mallory mentioned is it's part ADHD, also part being FI, too. It's like FI mm -hmm. can only do what its heart is into. If it tries to force itself to finish something that it's not fully invested in, it sometimes won't end up finishing it at all. But I guess ADHD exaggerates that trait even more, and it causes it even harder time to follow through than natural. Yeah. So exactly. It's amazing, but that's, thank you so much. <laughs> that, that was so cool. When, when I heard about uh, Mallory's example about the flag, I also like when she's talking about schoolwork, um, what they call that, it's it's diverted attention. So a lot of people look at it as like, it's a distraction, right? But your your mm -hmm. mind's like, it's not like you're dysfunctioning. Like there's like, mm -hmm. your mind's like, going like beep during that time period. It's like, it's yeah. focused on something else. It's like on some sort of random idea. Yeah. So right. Yeah, so uh, oh, so they call that hyper focusing, right? It's kind of like yes, so that's it's like it goes big. like right, right. It go it goes like back and forth, like the there um, some things that you're completely not can't focus on things that you are very very focused on. You can't like um, get off of that thing to something else. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right? yes. yes. And another, another thing that reminds me of like what what Joyce was talking about was the because I think if you if you have the INFP avatar. So the avatar mm -hmm. is like, it's it's like that player is like that um, character in a game, which is not really user friendly in a way, <laughs> but but it has neat tricks. Like it has neat tricks if you really learn how to use the avatar. But like it, it's like but like you know if you have like plus ADHD, that's like it's it's a it's a it's a really difficult avatar. So there's similar there's similar pieces there. ADHD is not like a you know user friendly, and also INFP is not user friendly, but it's like they're like combined in a certain kind of way. <laughs> but once you master it, it's it's going to be like a, it's like a super character. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I agree. Um, so like a couple of things. Um, you're saying Mallory about like you're not sure if you still have it. So like. So from my understanding, just reading um, up on it, on ADHD, so about, um, I think it was like 30 to 40% of people who have ADHD as children, um, they grow out of it uh, when they hit puberty because their brain develops in like in a different way um, or like their, their brain fully develops. So like it, it kind of like, I guess, cures the, um, the, uh, the disorder um, so your brain develops in, in like the way that it's like, I guess, normally supposed to. So, um, so then people can grow out of it, but about 50% of people who have it in, 
uh, as children, they do, um, it, it, it does carry on into adulthood. And see, that was like the thing for me was that like, I did well in school. Um, and, and I was reading that like some people like it's hard to detect because that you can do well in school. Um, but then when you start getting into adulthood and then your your normal coping strategies don't work because things are significantly harder. Your attention is being pulled into so many different directions and you really are pressing on your executive function. That's when you really start noticing it. So like, yeah, you might when you move out, you might start really noticing it. Um, you know, if, if, if it's something that you do have, um, that was, you know, kind of what, um, I think what did it for me too. I didn't realize that like when I was young, I had, you know, I, I was having distractibility issues, but it was really apparent, um, at home for me. Um, you know, I could not follow multi-step instructions. Um, I've been fired from jobs before because I, I have a hard time following instructions. Like, I almost got fired at one job because I um, I used to work at Best Buy and I used to sell cell phones. And if you don't, if you activate a phone that the customer did not ask for, you cannot resell that phone again because essentially what it does is it burns the SIM card. So it it um, the SIM card gets attached to whatever carrier that you're you that you've activated the phone on. And that happened a couple of times because I was not paying attention. I was not paying attention to what phone I was grabbing. And that happened enough times where I got like a final warning. Um, and I, you know, so stuff like that, like I really started noticing, like as I was getting older and I was going in and I was working in jobs that was requiring more executive functioning um, where it was really apparent. And then I did, um, you know, um, um, at home too was an issue with my mom. Um, my mom is an ESTJ, so that was really difficult. <laughs> you know, not only is it difficult because she is the inverse of me, but also being a, a TE dominant, I mean, TE is executive functioning essentially. And so me having difficulty in that was really hard. For, like, like she was so structured about things. Like if I didn't do things exactly the right way, like my mom would get extremely frustrated. Um, and so that was really difficult um, she thought I was being rude when I would like kind of get distracted or not like follow instructions properly. But that wasn't it. I just really like people who have ADHD. They have like short term memory issues um, where. So that's why like multi step instructions are really difficult because like as soon as somebody like moves on to the ne next instruction, our brain has not processed the prior instruction. Mm -hmm. So it makes it really difficult. Um and so that was a pain point for me. And then when I when I was diagnosed by my therapist and psychiatrist, and I was looking back at report cards in elementary school, it was crazy seeing some comments like, you know, very bright, intelligent, does not follow directions. Um, you know, that was a common theme in a lot of my report cards, does not follow directions on you know, when, when my teachers would have parent teacher conference with my parents, they would say, he's a great kid, but he talks out of turn. He blurts out. He does not raise his hand. He gets up out of his seat and starts talking to people, you know, like, so there is just this inability to kind of like sit still, um, especially if I find something boring or I don't care about it. It's just like, it makes it really hard to focus. Um, you know, so like uh, one, 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 uh, uh, um, exercise that I, I, I had found, um, cause my mom saved all this stuff. SI, <laughs> she saved everything. This one exercise that I had to, you know, I guess I had to do in third grade or something like that. It was a testing on how well I followed directions. And like the comment was, does not follow directions well. Um, so that was like, I was like, wow, like, I just wish that I had, you know, known this so I could have gotten help. Um, you know, and not felt like a total and complete idiot, um, which I felt a lot of times, um, you know, so, and the other thing too, is that like, I think this was mentioned by, I, I want to say that like, as far as like, there are specific criteria in the DSM-5, which is the manual that psychologists use in order to diagnose mental health disorders. Um, so one of the things is like, this has to affect, you know, all aspects of your life. So, um, for a certain period of time, I think it's like six months or something like that. So it can't just be 
at work. It has to be like at work, school and home, you know? And so like that, that's a, a, also a big indicator as well. Like, so like if, if, just because like you're bored at school, you know, you don't like a subject that you're, that you're, you're learning and you get distracted. Like that doesn't mean that you have ADHD. Like it has to be like, if you're having issues in the work and at home and just all, all your, all environments that you're in, that's a, a strong indicator that you, that you have it. Mm-hmm. And I figured that's, that's pretty much how it is. That you'd have to struggle with it everywhere and possibly have m- multiple issues as opposed to just maybe distractibility. Right. <laughs> but, I found that like um, I I had an extremely difficult job at one point where I had to not only know a million things but have to know how to apply them in different ways. And mm, so yes, context I had switching. Job, yeah, I had that job for not very long, obviously. <laughs> uh, but you know, I learned a lot. Like the thing is, I, I didn't necessarily struggle one hundred percent at that job. I just knew it wasn't for me. Mm. Um, but um, that's kind of when, that was when I was in college when I had that job. And at that, at that time, I felt like maybe perhaps, even if I don't have ADHD in a severe way at this point, I think there, having medication would not hurt, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. I feel like, um, I just, I just feel like it's helpful anyway. So I'm, I'm, I'm no longer against medication as a kid. I hated it. It's something I had to do every day, but yeah, um, yeah. Now I'm not opposed to it, and I can see. Perhaps I've grown out of certain things, um, but not everything. I think maybe it's still there in a way. It not- is. Yeah. Like, or I'm not saying. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off and say you are. You can continue. No, it's okay. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> oh, okay. No, just like I, I just that's something I read that like certain things like you just learn how to adapt. Mm-hmm. And so you just kind of work it out. But like it's what it sounds like in your situation is you've learned how to adapt certain situations, but there are still like, there are still people, there's going to be some residual effect of it. Um, and, and that's the important thing too, is that like, um, like when you're taking medication, like medication is not a cure all, like it doesn't cure you of your ADHD. Um, like, I, a statistic that I read was like, it might like help with like 80% of your symptoms, but like you still have to take an active, um, active steps like you're doing Mallory, like just saying, okay, like I'm going to really put effort into doing this. So like it, it should absolutely, medication should absolutely be in combination. If you are going to take it, which you don't have to, there are ways that you can regulate it, like exercise, diet, etc. cetera. Um, but if you are going to take medication, like you absolutely, it has to be in conjunction with other things like therapy and diet, exercise, et cetera. Sorry, Liam. It looks like you want to say something. <laughs> oh, what, 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 I don't, what I want to say was that, yeah, it may, may not always be easy from the outside for people to see the ADHD. So it's sometimes like that, often the, the struggle is private because you are very, managing, very. right? So like, mm-hmm. uh, so like, yes, uh, make it to college and all that, but involve some effort, right? And yes. not and it's because we also, you know, we have our strengths as well. So that, that definitely helps us, but we're kind of like going around kind of uh, maybe accomplishing school or work uh, from a kind of like a left field approach, like kind of yeah, like some, doing something different, but it's, it's, it's tough because you're not following the molds. I think it's easier just to follow the mold and just like um, if the mold fits well for you and you don't really have to do that big mental struggle, but this is, there's, there's a struggle, like yeah, yeah you consciously struggle mm-hmm. when, yes. uh, when you have ADHD and, and people see you succeed and they don't, they don't necessarily see that struggle a, as Mm-mm. well. No, not, that, go, sorry, go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you go, you go ahead. Sorry, 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 <laughs> like, for everybody, like this is, this is definitely an ADHD thing where it's just like, you hear something you're like, ah, you know, I just want to yeah. say something. Um, impulse control. Um, no, but like, it's just like what you're saying, Leon, so resonates with me. And that's what like my, my therapist said. She's like, ADHD is kind of like a silent, like a, what did she say? Like a, something like a silent, uh, it's a silent suffering because like, it's not, it's not visible. Like with somebody who has like, um, like maybe a bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, where it's like, there's like a lot of external factors. It is like, it's, it's so, so much more internal. Um, so like people don't see 
like they, they only see the end product. They don't see like the circuitous route that you had to take just to get there um, and, and the distress that it caused. I mean, like, just I can't tell you how many times, like just uh, just thinking in elementary school where like I literally the, like the night before, like starting at seven or eight o'clock working on a book report or some sort of project. Like, you know, and my poor mom, you know, you know, as much as sometimes I was frustrated with her, but, it, you know, she would be up with me, you know, till three or four in the morning. Sometimes I'd go to bed and she'd finish the projects for me. Honestly, like, that's why I think I survived as long as I did, because yeah. if my mom did not finish, like, some of the stuff for me, I would have... I, I would have had these issues of turning in problems. I would have flunked out a lot. So like I, I, my mom saved me a lot actually um, from, from, from experiencing like severe um, issues and failure in school um, because of my, my ADHD, my procrastination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, it's important to keep in mind there's like different kinds of presentations. So like they also have ADHD and they have ADHD primary hyperactive and then they have one that's, right in attendance so i'm like the in attendance type like there's this light on my face that's like really fascinating like i could see the sun like in the wind. It's like wow this is like and i'm like my attention is like kind of like going in that direction a lot <laughs> towards the sun the sun in my face but um um yeah so there's there's, there's different kinds of presentations of, of it um I know you, you both have experience with um, of medication and all, right? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. so like for, for me, I only I only took it for four days. So I, I took uh, Adderall for four days mm -hmm. and it made me feel like a superhero, you know? Yes. I was, like, <laughs> yes, I, was, I, was I was like the king. I was like, yes. I, I totally rocked. I totally rocked. I was like the most, I, I was the most amazing person. I was like thinking, yes. I remember, I am the most amazing person in the world. And then I also felt like there was a lot of, um, depth perception like i felt like i could like i was like walking and then there's the bush and then there's the, the house okay. and it's like there's like a greater distance between them i'm like wow it's like that's so weird because like i literally had the same experience when I first <laughs> yeah, yeah, it. Same run. <laughs> Dude, you guys are lucky i wish i took adderall when i was like 13 and i felt like i was gonna die every day I felt, <laughs> boring. I felt just really sad and i was like yes i gotta do my work like it made yeah. me feel it just didn't work. But I don't know how it would work on me now. Maybe it helped me make me feel like a superhero because that's how I'm sick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, I think, like, medication, like, I didn't realize that there was, like, so many other, like, meds out there for ADHD. Like, I was literally messi messaging uh, or talking to an ISTP yesterday on Twitter. Um, they said that they were uh, going to get a prescription for Vinase, which I'd never heard of before. Um, there's, there's so many other... Um, there, obviously there's Ritalin, Albuterol or something like that, or no, that's, that's a, that's an inhaler. Anyways, there's a lot of, there, there, there's a lot of medication out there. And so like, you know, because we are neurodiverse, you know, everybody's brains a little, you know, physiologically a little bit different, like medications are going to have different effects. So that's kind of like, I guess why you work with a therapist or a, a psychiatrist to kind of like, you know see which one is working which one's not but yeah like i felt i remember when i the first day i took it i literally started like as soon as i took it and it started hitting i, I started crying because i was so emotionally overwhelmed i like with this depth perception thing like everything felt like it was in 3d and <laughs> i was like whoa I was so overstimulated with like, I never noticed any of these details before. It was like absolutely insane. And then I remember yeah. tweeting like, is this what like TJs feel like all the time? <laughs> because I was just like, I felt like a superhuman just like getting tasks done. And I was like reading through things really quickly. I could focus. It was like, it was an insane experience. <laughs> wow. That sounds great. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah, yeah. You should try it. <laughs> I, mean, like, um, I, I see what you're saying like when you feel on how you feel when you're on it because this is why I'm like I'm like very much like teetering on the severity of it because sometimes yeah. I very much do feel like oh this I feel normal like I feel like how an INTJ <laughs> would feel like <laughs> I can connect the dots pretty well like I don't I don't feel like I struggle with it a lot and so when I hear you guys stories and and um how you feel on it like I feel like if I took it I would just turn into like Spock <laughs> I mean, yeah, because like it, and here's the thing though, like it does, your brain does adjust to it. So, like, it does, like, you 
start feeling normal after a while. Like it, it doesn't feel like you're on the Adderall um, until you're off it. And then you're like, wow, I really, <laughs> this feels very different. Mm-hmm. But, um, but like, that's like my psychiatrist said, that's how it's supposed to be. Like you should be like, you eventually get it to an equilibrium and you shouldn't feel like you're amped up all the time. Like it just should help you feel normal. It should, it should help make you make things easier um, not again, not that it cures everything, but it just helps it make it more manageable. So I'm definitely like, I feel so much less anxious. And also like, I'm not as like, um, uh, so what is, there's like a, um, there's a term for it, but like people have ADHD have a really hard time with criticism. Um, I don't know, Liana, if you might be familiar with the term, but like, it's like, uh, it's like some sort of like rejection type of, I can't remember what it's called, but like you just get very sensitive towards criticism. Um, I don't know how you're not like, I would be so annoyed with that, <laughs> with that line on my face. Also, it's another thing, like, because like your brain is all, you know, it's neurodiverse and discombobulated. Like some people have ADHD are also very hypersensitive to things. Like I'm very hypersensitive to light and sound and also things on my skin. Like, like it feels like, especially I have to have where, like I have to have comfortable things because then like my skin gets agitated a lot more easily, um, which is uh, hyper hypersensitivities. Right? Yeah. So like, which is interestingly connected to me being an SP Dom in Enneagram. Um, it's like all connected, but yes, hypersensitive. Yeah. Um, I don't understand. Like I took this medication that almost like, I feel like had the latest one. I don't remember what it was called, but this is the one I took before I stopped taking it. It made mm. me honestly feel more antsy. It made me feel like mm. I had to move my legs or something, and it made me feel almost like giving more anxiety. So I don't know what that was about. Is yeah, it- there's some there's some medication. I was just like kind of to prep to prep a little bit for this. Like I was reading my book, which by the way, anybody who's interested, including you guys, um, delivered from distraction is an excellent book. Um, I would highly recommend. Um, but they're they're saying that like because so, there's a whole chapter on medication. I I think there I was reading like that there was an anecdote about one of the the author is a a psychiatrist and one of his patients took a medication had a similar effect where it made them more antsy so it's like you have to like it, it that's why like it, it I, I can imagine it's frustrating like when you don't like when you have to like kind of cycle through all these medications to see which one is a good fit mm-hmm. yeah that was a huge source of frustration for me when I was younger so that's what caused me to stop and just say, yeah whatever the issue is, I'm going to work on it without medication and I'm going to show you all that I can. Yeah. Right. (laughs) And you know, yeah, I think, I think I did, I did well for me, but I, I I often go back and think how much better I could have done if I remained Mm. on the medication that worked for me. And so I'm just very much a teeter totter, like, should I just sort of go through life and see what happens in my adulthood or should I, just take medication and, and, and become a superhero and, and have depth perception. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I, I know this is probably a very FI answer, but like, it's just, it's really up to you because like, there are ways that you can, like, there are ways that there are coping mechanisms that you can do. And this book that I told you about deliver from distraction offers some without you having to take medication. So it's absolutely doable um, to live a life with ADHD without having to take meds. It's just like you're, you're, preference and, and your tolerance. Um, you know, I, um, like just for me personally, like it, it's just something that I feel better doing. Um, it, it's just, it's just more helpful in you know, just my, my day-to-day life. And like I said, like when I'm not taking it, like I definitely feel the effects. Um, but like, yeah, there's, there's other you can do plenty of other things without having to take medication that would help mitigate the effects of ADHD. Oh, I see. Thank you for your input. Yeah. But I, I, if you want, you should try, just get, try it, see how it works. Cause again, your brain could have adjusted in a different way. And so maybe it might be more receptive to other medication. I don't know. I'm not like a, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I don't know how that stuff works, but. Okay. I'll see. <laughs> this is super fascinating. And so I'm wondering, what are some differences you see between 
typical INFP traits and ADHD. So where's mm. the line where ADHD begins and INFP stops? Or is it like a meld of the two all the time because you're both? I, I think an interesting thing is that um, ADHD now, it's it's defined clinically. So it's defined in terms of like your behaviors. So mm. like you could say like, oh, there tends to be certain kinds of INFP behaviors and if they kind of like match up but as you know, Joyce, you were talking about before, um, they could be coming from different causes. Like they could be like, um, there's a brain that's kind of like an ADHD brain and there's an INFP brain and there's some INFPs who are gonna have ADHD brains. And so like um, the combo of that. Um, so the thing is like, if you, if we give taken like the current definition of ADHD like as clinical, then you could say, yes, there is like an overlap. Because there's some similarity, as you said, with perceiving and <laughs> and ADHD like traits. So yeah, that that's 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 my thought on the matter. I think it could manifest itself like okay, so like where does it? I'm trying to think of like something that's like distinct to people who have ADHD um, that wouldn't be found in somebody who is INFP, for example, and is neurotypical. Um, because there is, I see what you're saying, Chris, because there is a lot of overlap. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's like, it's almost like as if <laughs> INFP, there's like a one to one ratio. Because like yeah. the fact that we have in- inferior TE, which is directly linked to like, you know, executive dysfunction for mm-hmm. um, for people with ADHD, that's such a great question. Um, yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah, it's almost it's like almost. When, uh, I, I, there's this uh, YouTuber called EJRD. He says, like, type 5 Enneagram is basically INTP. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Like, there's, a, there's a strong correlation. And, like, you know, especially to, like, the, the, um, like, the feel, like, people who have ADHD, like, are feel things so much more. Um, and that's very FI, you know? yeah, <laughs> like FI Dom. So that's like, I don't know. I, I'm trying to like, that, that's such a great question. I think, you know what it is? I think that like, it's, it's the, maybe it might have to do with the environment potentially. Like if you're noticing, like maybe INFPs might, um, like a, 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 a neurotypical INFP might have like, an issue in one area of their life, but it might not carry into other areas. So, you know, they might be able to, um, yeah, impulse control. That's a, that's, that's one maybe. Um, it overlaps still. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> There's a little bit of I, 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 Well, okay. Here's the thing. I think maybe some INFPs might seem who are, who have ADHD might seem more, like ENFPs, because maybe we might be a little bit more excitable and extroverted, whereas like, um, um, like we might tap into NE a little bit more, um, whereas maybe like just a, a neurotypical INFP, they are not, um, like they can be excitable and friendly, but they're not going to be as much as maybe a, a, a INFP who has ADHD. So some people might think the person, the INFP has ADHD might be an ENFP when they're not. Um, sorry. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much done. Oh, okay. So um, I think what we're getting at is like, maybe it's a spectrum of severity of certain things. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. how, how powerful, whatever it is, how strong it is, uh, mm-hmm. if it reveals itself more or less. Like you can have all these things as an INFP, but if it gets more dramatic or mm. more or stronger perhaps mm. that would be an INFP with ADHD as opposed to an INFP without yeah no I think that's that's a good point because yeah. like yeah so it's uh, I guess kind of what I maybe what I'd said earlier I think was just there's an exaggeration so it's like yeah. it's not just like you are bad with structure and organization like you're really bad at it you know <laughs> or like yeah. you know it's not that you feel things you know like you really feel them you know um oh that that the word i was i think i was looking for is like emotional dysphoria i think um people of adhd tend to experience emotional dysphoria a lot more than other people so like i think you would like feel a lot more negative feelings and like feel them more intensely um 
Oh yeah, that's so hard because there are INFPs who are hypersensitive or who are, em- who are empathic, and that was like very correlated with ADHD. Mm-hmm. Joyce, you might be onto something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What's the bottom of this? <laughs> well, I was yeah. I was thinking the way I um, because I've been talking to, to pe- different people with ADHD and their different types, and also like my research study too with the interviews. Um, it's yeah. I think it's like uh, when I look at different types, for instance, like. Um, they express their ADHD through their cognitive function channels, if you may, like it's yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's their version. So I, I talk with like, you know, with expert sensing and they talk about a lot of, it's like a lot of random kind of things, but it's all like things like, and also if it's mixed right. with different things, like, oh, I wonder how like this thing works, how this doorknob works, for instance. Mm. And, then, and then that, that's their, that's their ADHD spiel. Like, and I, I've met like, J types with ADHD too. So like an ESFJ would like, it, it could be like introvert sensing, but like constantly blurting out introvert sensing stuff and like <laughs> incessantly. And so that's another, and also like, I feel like there's definitely like ADHD, like extra feeling dominant types. They're kind of like, um, they're um, talking to like different kinds of people or they have a lot of like expressiveness and it shoots out and they're kind of in, ADHD s kind of pattern. Yeah. That is really cool, Leon. Amazingly cool. <laughs> With type talks, I have a lot of guests on and they tend to tell me like their diagnosis. So I tend to know everyone's diagnosis. And mm-hmm. here's here's what I see. I see that perceivers, like so people with a P at the end of the code, they're more predisposed to being diagnosed with ADHD and to question if they have it. So they're like, do I have mm-hmm. it? Because one of yeah. the traits is distractibility, which is some, which is also a P trait in general, because with SE and NE, you're always looking for that new thing that's coming into your perception. Right. And so I can correlate. One of the really well-known people in the type space who is an INTJ has ADHD and they're still mm. able to TE. I haven't asked them about their experience with ADHD, but it, it's, it would be different than with an NFP, I would assume, because mm. with NFPs, it's almost like their INFP or ENFP-ness compounds with the ADHD. It makes it like yeah. extra, extra ADHD. <laughs> yes, yes. It, it like really, it, it totally does exaggerate like your your cognitive functions like everything is dialed to like 12 you know so your fi is dialed to 12 like you intensely feel things and you're also like extremely strident about like these are my values <laughs> you know <laughs> like i'm gonna be stubborn and then like your and like the excitability too so which maybe we could come off as like an enfp where it's just like the any it was just like Ah, you know and then the si with like just the, the you know like i think that could probably with the hyper focusing and like the detail like really zooming it and just like really focusing and fixating on something and then like you know just like the te uh just it it, it exacerbates like the issues with te of just like not you know being good with structure and stuff like that i really think yeah it just manifests itself in that way so it's like yeah it's like infps with adhd are like regular infps but like dialed to 12. <laughs> like, or like, extra. like, Have you guys ever wondered, like, is ADHD, is that really a problem? Or is it just a way of being? It's, I think it's a way of being. It's just like who you are. And like, I think, you know, like even the book was talking, the, the, the Deliver from Distraction talks about this, where it's like, like, it's, people view it as a problem and it just is, you know, is. like, you know, like you have it, you know, and there's like, you can't change your brain, you know, so you just, yeah. There's a quote that lives rent free in my brain. And <laughs> it's, <laughs> uh, it's when I think someone interviewed Kanye West and I don't, rem- I can't recall if he has eight or has been diagnosed with ADHD or. Cause he's person. diagnosed with bipolar, but I wouldn't be surprised if you have ADHD because um, there are, uh, so there's something called comorbidity, meaning like um, when you have ADHD or any other disease, like sometimes there is a concomitant, uh, concomitant, concomitant other like disorder. So like common for ADHD, uh, people have ADHD, they commonly also have 
um, like dyslexia, anxiety, which is what I have, or bipolar disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder. So he has been diagnosed with bipolar, but I would not be surprised if he has ADHD because he definitely has a lot of the symptoms. Sorry. Yeah, someone asked him a question and I can't remember the exact question or how he answered, but I remember him saying, or ADHD is just thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm like, I, you know, I hear ADHD is this, you know, it's lumped in with a lot of different things, but um, it's not, I mean, I don't ever see it really as like, its own entity of a problem. Like, I really think it is just, it's just a part of a person and the way that life is built, um, the way capitalism has this function, it's all function, it's not really helpful to the INFP or ADHD brain. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, would ADHD be even be a thing if, if our entire way of living was restructured differently to let people live in a way that they des actually desire, as opposed to having to fit into a mold. That, that, yeah. that, that's like such a wonderful point because you could look at it this way. Like, um, so the world's like uh, made, of course it's made for neurotypical people, but you never say like neurotypical people have problems. Right, it's just the world right. just kind of like matches up. So you know, like if you change the school system, such as, um, for instance, like instead of doing academics, everyone does sports. Say that we have like a super sports oriented culture, and instead of having a period of math and science, you have a period of like basketball and another period of like tennis. And then like some some people are going to struggle with the system with that system that don't normally struggle with it. Right. They're going to be like really tired at the end of the day. And yeah. like another example is like, if you look at like, um, like difficulties, like for, for instance, like dyslexia, for instance, <clears throat> um, before there's a writing system, um, there's a whole period of human history where there's no writing system. So if you have any issues with being able to uh, read or anything like that, that wouldn't have existed, mm -hmm. existed then. Right. And yet we have like a disorder, like dyscalculia, which is like, you have, a disability with math, right? Which is kind of funny because, you know, uh, because m m we never say people have disability with art, for instance, because it's really, really has to come down with what society values. If society more or less, more values math, so you would have a math disorder. You grow up with self-esteem if you don't uh, read well or you don't do math well, but, uh, mm -hmm. but, but you, you have good self-esteem if you know you have like an art disability, but nobody calls it an art disability because no one's gonna call you as someone as someone having that kind of difficulty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like I, so, <clears throat> so this is like kind of something. So I, I'm I, I study history and I want to go to grad school for history. And one of the things that historians, uh, professional historians do is they like to point out how so much that we believe is like objective capital T truth, like, and has existed across all historical contexts is actually not the case. Like we, so much of our experience, not all of it. I mean, I, I believe in, a, in an objective reality outside of my own subjective experience, but so much. You're just imagining us. Right. <laughs> um, but so much of our experience is structured by language and culture. Uh, you know, it, it's it's how we categorize and label things. We don't realize that like th like things that like categories and, and a status of something that we think has existed, you know, since the beginning of history has not. Like, it's just that somebody decided to label it, to, to give language to it. And this is like a, like a great example, Mallory and, and, and Leon, what you're bringing up of ADHD being that situation, right? So like, you know, there, there are plenty of, of um, uh, you know, situations or I guess things that are actually cultural that were just it just was like, we we're talking, it just is, you know, how we were talking about like Mallory, like, and to, but then somebody came along a psychiatrist or, you know, a scientist or whomever. And then, and then said, Oh, this is a thing. I'm going to give language to it and label it something. And then I'm going to categorize it. And then it's going to be something that is 
different and separate, right? So, and I think that, I mean, there's a whole history on like mental health disorders and like, you know, just the, the, the labeling of people with disorder, like it's, it's, yeah, it's a thing. So I think the exact same thing can be applied to ADHD. Like, just like you're saying, Leon, like it's only a thing because somebody has decided like that it is a thing that is a thing that we should be concerned about or that is different. Um, But it just so happens to be that like our culture is not structured in such a way as to be accommodating to people who have neurodivergent brains. So like, it wouldn't be a thing if we, if, if we emphasize something, if our culture emphasized something else. So I think that's like really a very crucial point that you guys brought up. And I think I could get even deeper into it. Like, I think everybody on earth, is there even such thing as having a <clears throat> brain, a normal way of functioning? Right. You know? So when I hear people say like, oh, well, that's what normal people do. It's like, don't, doesn't everybody have something that they struggle with in some way? So it's like, I really say, um, you know, that's a problem. That's not how you should do things. This is how you do things. You know, I I don't think, I don't believe in the reality of that. Mm -hmm. Well, I I believe that, I believe Joyce has a perfect brain. I don't (laughs) believe that perfect brain. (laughs) Yes. I we can all agree on that. <laughs> yeah, amazing. My words of affirmation, love language is being filled up. Thanks, guys. <laughs> oh, you're you're welcome. That's that's my top love language. Um, yeah, there are certain societal truths that aren't actually truths. They're just what right. people have agreed upon as a consensus to be true. Yep. It's kind that's of like an right. arbitrary truth that's not actually a truth. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think there's like a a spectrum of neurodivergence. There are some people who are very neurodivergent, Mm -hmm. but I think everyone has like a tiny bit of neurodivergence, like a differentness in society, but some people have a lot of it. So they're very, very, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, so they're very, very neurodivergent, but everyone is not the cookie cutter uh, fit of society. Right. People should appreciate neurodivergence and celebrate the diversity of not only the outside, but diversity of our minds too, that mm-hmm. we're all different in our in our minds and to celebrate all the different wirings <laughs> and the different ways of living. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And like, the thing is like, maybe like, you know, physiologically there might be sort of a standardized brain, but like, I, I think, you know, with our understanding of like, of like epigenetics and, um, you know, just where like culture can have some sort of potential effect on the development of, of the brain. Like I, I think, and then your, your environment, you know, like that also has an, a, a, has an effect as well, like on, on like just basically the, the neurons in your brain. So like maybe the physical structure of the brain looks the same to everybody and might be the same, but like the way the neurons are connecting in different regions of the brain, I think is going to be different in everybody. Um, I remember listening to, um, I'm, I, I love listening to podcasts. Um, and there was a, um, there, there was a uh, evolutionary biologist I was listening to. And he said that, that we come, we are born into this world with about like 85% of who we are. And the rest is going to be our environment. And so I think that remaining a 15% is going to like uh, of the environment is going to have an effect on like the internal structure and wiring of our brain. So that's why every single brain, even though it, on the exterior, like an, and the general shape is going to be the same, but just the way it's wired, the way the neurons are all connecting is going to be different. And I think that, you know, obviously the environment is going to make up that, that, that difference, you know, and, you know, of course, genetics as well, um, just how that manifests in, in certain uh, traits. So, yeah, like, I, I, I don't think that there is like a neurotypical, you know, brain um, when is we that, factor that in. Who is this typical, normal, really, <laughs> Uh, admirable person that people are basing this neurotypical idea off of because right i mean you know to me everyone is so extremely different and everyone has their flaws everyone has their great aspects right. too and so it's like i don't know like i i've thought about that before like what is this neurotypical thing 
And I, I think some people associate neurotypical with having zero to maybe a, just maybe one issue or something. But I'm like, mm, I don't know exactly what that means. There, there's, that's basically the message of um, of the Myers Briggs. They have that book called Gifts Differing, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's like wired uh, differently from one another. That's what I really appreciate about its original message because it's about um, there's these types and uh, there's strengths and weaknesses to each one. So I like how it has that level of depth to it. So like, you know, with the big five, I think there's value to the big five, but uh, I think one of the issues of the, of the big five, you have the ocean, right? You have the openness, conscientiousness, whatever, neuroticism is like, <laughs> is, is definitely saying or implying that one side of scale is better than the other one. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's the thing, like, yeah, the, what some, some, some type of way of thinking or way of functioning is better than the other creates that whole, like, neurotypical versus neurodivergent divide. I, I, I agree. I, I, I understand, like, the reasoning behind it, um, you know, because it's like, you know, the, it's a very, um, like, TE and scientific way of viewing the world. Like, if you're, if, if we're going to, we have to have some sort of like general universal model from which we can compare to so we can like understand like where it diverges. Um, and I think for like a scientific enterprise, I can understand, but then like sometimes like the, like the goals of science and the goals of like, you know, just human beings and um, just humans lived experience are not always um, in alignment so, um, but I, I understand why there is this, like, we have neurotypical, neurotypical neurodivergent because the, the scientific enterprise almost requires there to be, a standard. To, for it to be right, to be right, structured in that way. So you can see, so there's like, a, so you can measure a sort of a statistical deviation, you know, in one direction or the other. Um, you know, so like there are benefits, you know, so you can understand more, you know, like, um, but, but then again, it could, it can run into other problems. Like if, if there's so much of a focus on that and not like on like, especially when it deals with humans, because like, like, we're not like, you know, we're not like physics calculations, you know, <laughs> there's, there's <laughs> where like, you just, you plug in numbers and then you get outcomes something on the other end right like it's very different you know so um with human beings and there's just a significant variability um so i yeah i i, I see where, there, where the the impetus behind it but like i agree with you guys that like it's um not always helpful um to view it in in that way yeah yeah, yeah. science is a funny thing science is very definitive and it's very this or that um yeah and yeah, that's just how that's how I see it. And it's yeah. like not everything's super black or white, I guess. Yeah. No, it's not. That's very true. I really like the neurodivergent movement and how they're trying to destigmatize to certain mm -hmm. things. It's kind of like you bring awareness the different ways that a person can operate and you notice that different doesn't mean wrong. And mm -hmm. different Yeah there are some certain pluses that come with being different. Like what Leon said at the beginning, when you have ADHD, there is a trend with that and creativity too. So when your brain prioritizes certain areas over other areas, you'll just be different, but it's not wrong to be different. And I, I, I like that. The whole notion of Myers-Briggs is to accept, like to, to understand where others are different and to kind mm -hmm. of celebrate those differences. Yeah, to see them as gifts and contributions. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, to the world. And when you stop shaming certain traits, you allow people to live more in their purpose. By embracing our neurodiversity, we're able to capitalize on the things that comprise our purpose. And instead of rejecting the things that we're good at, we're able to make art out of our strengths. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> That's awesome. I I, I love that, I, and I, I just I feel the extroverted feeling champion. In you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I you know I, I I think Joyce, you make a beautiful point, and I think that you know one of my like you know when I when I was diagnosed, I, I really felt it 
it was very, you know, personal for my FI that like, I wanted to, like, I wanted this to be like, I wanted to champion this cause because uh, of just spreading awareness because I want, I don't want people to feel, you know, like they're, they're outcasts or they, they, like they don't belong or there's something wrong with them. And I think that there still is a stigma and I just, I want to, I want there to be empathy more for people. Um, I, I think that like, so often, like if, if you don't fit into a particular mold, the, the, the thought that comes to somebody's mind is why is this person, you know, um, you know, why is this person weird or different in a bad way? And it's never like, I'm curious to get to know and understand why this person is the way they are. And I think there needs to be a lot more of that instead of just immediately having a reaction of this person is different and therefore this is bad because it doesn't fit in with like my, my preconceived model of, of how people should be. Um, I, I just, you know, there, there should be more, there should be more interest in, in understanding differences. Yeah. So, so Joyce, I'm going to let you know, everybody, thank you for having me on. I'll be headed out. It's a pleasure talking with Christian and, uh, and Mallory, and it's like such a great topic to really connect on, especially since it's so personal. Mm -hmm. too. Yeah, it was amazing having you on, Leon. To end up the chat, do you have anything you'd like to leave the viewers off with? Resources or words of wisdom, advice, or something that helps you figure out something about yourself, uh, about your ADHD that you want to tell and bestow? I think what's really important is um, if you think you have ADHD and you have the resources, you know, the, you know, the financial or, you know, resources or access to healthcare or healthcare professionals, um, get, get, get checked out. Like that's, it's so important. Um, I think, um, you don't have to, you know, so that there, there are people I know who have never been like officially diagnosed, but they've done research and they, they have a lot of the, you know, the symptoms match up. But, um, but I think, you know, if you can, if it's, if it's feasible, I would recommend doing so getting, trying to get diagnosed. Um, there are different ways you can do that. You can speak to a, a your primary care physician if you have one. Um, you know, they, they might be able to recommend someone. You can speak to a, a psychologist. Um, there are a lot of, but, but bottom line is like, do your research. Um, there's so many resources out there on Google. Um, I, a, a book that I mentioned earlier, Delivered from Distraction, absolutely recommend that book. Um, there's even a questionnaire, kind of like a, a self-diagnosis test um, that they have. Um, but of course, like they instruct, like, if you can try and get tested or seen by, by a medical professional. Um, and, and the, I guess, but beyond that, like, like this disease, I don't even want to call it disease. This, this uh, way of life, this way of this, this way of thinking, like, it doesn't have to, like, it doesn't have to cripple you. It doesn't have to like prevent you from, from being successful and being happy. Um, like, I, I think that's why it's so important to try and, and if you feel like you have this after watching it to do your research and, and if possible, get diagnosed because then you can, f you can find the appropriate ways to deal with this or not even deal. I don't even like that word to just learn how to, to manage it better and to like work with what you got, which is like a really, you know, it, really incredible, incredible brain because <laughs> it, because you're, you're, you're thinking, um, it allows you to think in, in ways that, that are, are, are probably different than, than many other people. Um, so like, it, it doesn't have to be the end of your life, you know, like there, there are absolutely, there's absolutely, um, there's absolutely hope and just learn to be like, um, extend grace towards yourself. Um, because I think like it's really easy to compare yourself to like other people, who don't have ADHD and, and, you know, or compare yourself to like a system, the system that we have in place and, and just say, Oh, like, you know, because I don't live up to these standards um, or I don't function, I don't fit in the mold um, with these standards that, that like, I'm, you know, that I'm a failure, or I'm not competent or I'm not intelligent. 
Um, and, and those are all not true. Um, like, I think it's, it's really important to just, um, like I said, extend grace and say like, this is who I am and that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with me. I don't have like a disorder. I don't have a disease. Um, it's just how I was born. And so just like with everything, when, um, you know, we learn how to adapt and to adjust and that's, uh, you know, ADHD is no different. So, um, so it doesn't like having ADHD does not kind of like, you know, it does not spell doom for, for, um, the rest of your existence. Um, there's a lot of beautiful things about it. Um, it's just all about like learning to manage, manage the, the symptoms in, in the society and the culture that we live in. So just, you know, love yourself and the differences that you, that you have. Amen. You said it perfectly, perfectly. Yeah. You, there's nothing wrong with you. If you, if you, if you know you have it, there's, it's, it's not a huge problem. It's just a part of you. And honestly, it's, if you, you know, take command of certain things, it's, it can be wielded in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most likely, if you do have it, there's a million awesome things about you. So yep. uh, don't ever base yourself off of how other people are doing because everyone's so extremely different. And if you're like me and you're teetering on, you don't know how severe it is. You don't even know if you struggle with it as much as you used to. Definitely, like Christian said, do, do your research. See what can work for you. Um, and I wish you the best. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so wonderfully put. And so thank you so much, you both, for allowing us to really embrace our neurodiversity, to embrace the things that make us different, you know, the way, the little quirks that we have. I, I love the in-depth explanation of ADHD given by the both of you. Your SIs were great at recalling, like, <laughs> DSM-5, like, perfectly. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I was learning things. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it was incredible yeah yeah so thank you christian for giving us the history of adhd so well like i don't know you put it so perfectly so thank you christian <laughs> you're welcome mm -hmm. yeah and mallory i love your down-to-earthness how you were mm -hmm. able to provide examples from your life and to show the child side of how it's like to be a child with adhd yeah and I really appreciate you INFPs with your emotional depth. I love how, you know, you have as many layers of a emotional complexity as a crepe cake, which is like, you know, 50 layers of crepe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You keep going deeper and deeper. Yeah. And I appreciate just that endless depth and encouragement that you offer audience members and you offer me as well. So thank you for that. And thank you, Mallory, for showing me the band Incubus. It's really great. <laughs> and all that to the songs Dig and Love Hurts <laughs> and Drive. Wow. <laughs> yeah. No you both represent neurodivergent people with excellence. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I'm also neurodivergent, too. I have dyspraxia. So, yeah, the more you know. Yeah. Ooh, I did <laughs> not know that. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. there are a lot of these invisible type of things that people have, or <laughs> I don't know what you would call it, invisible, invisible challenges, or not yeah. even, I don't want to call it that, <laughs> but like, yeah. Yeah, I think it's called invisible illnesses, but illnesses has such a negative connotation. Um, yeah. And it doesn't really fit for what, you know, what they are. So it's like eh, invisible struggles, invisible, I don't know. Invisible struggles, yeah. And really quick, I do want to offer if anybody watches this video and um, you know they have questions, um, I think Joyce will probably link my Twitter handle in the uh, description box. Like, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, I want to provide support for people um, if they have any questions. This was a great chat on ADHD. I'm very touched to hear about both of your genuine experiences with it. And so thank you for being so FI authentic <laughs> and sharing your genuine takes. Everyone is better off because of that. And thank you everyone for watching. I'll see you all in the next episode.
拜拜。Bye. Thank、you